hopefully those that are joining are, are, are logging in now. So um, I'll say hi, I'm Paul Gooding from Millennium Science and um, we're doing another little lunch and learn series um, now in first September, October. And uh, if you need any information or anything as we, we go through talks or at the end, um, my email address is right there. So um, feel free to jot it down and, uh, and contact me or you can contact anyone at Millennium Science, go to the Millennium Science website and you can find uh, details about things on people to contact so all good so we uh, are running uh, this uh, series of, of three webinars we're just going to run through the the basics of of, of pack bio sequencing or hi-fi sequencing particularly uh, today on their sql2 instruments um, and um, in a couple of weeks time we're going to do uh, a slightly more focused uh, look at uh, rare inherited diseases in, in humans. So looking for those rare and uh, normally novel mutations that um, haven't previously been uh, been uh, worked out and, and see how uh, PAT biosequencing is, is able to, um, to find those uh, mutations. And then a further two weeks later, um, towards the end of October, we're going to um, do a, a look at, uh, at sequencing 16S in uh, microbial samples, so for microbiome samples like soil samples and, and uh, say nasal swabs and things like that. So we'll focus um, why uh, PacBio and high vice sequencing has a, a benefit for sequencing full length uh, 16S for, for identification of microbes. So um, we let me get my slides moving. Yeah, we have done a lunch and learn um, series um, previously about six months ago. And it was a similar sort of thing. We started with a with a sort of a, a basics talk, uh, which will be similar to today. Um, and, and then we moved on to, to three specialist um, sort of subjects. We looked at, um, at microbiome projects ra rather than 16S. We actually looked at, at, at full um, microbe sequencing um, using uh, uh, hi-fi reads. Uh, we then looked at, at, at ge whole genome sequencing in, in plants and animals. Um, so, you know, some plants and uh, are, have very difficult genomes to sequence. So we, we looked particularly at, at sequencing some of those um, more difficult genomes and also genomes that didn't have references and, and things like that. So we, 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 we gave that a look. And then finally, we finished up with transcriptomics or um, in PacBio speak, it's isoseq. So um, looking for the isoforms um, uh, um, within the transcriptome and identifying novel isoforms which is um, um, a very powerful technique that you can use with, with Hi-Fi sequencing with PacBio. So, um, um, so that's the that's the plan. Let's uh, let's start to to get into it. So um, today, Hi-Fi basics and, and the SQL two. We'll go through um, um, what Hi-Fi sequencing uh, means, how it works, and, and how that all fits together on the SQL two instrument, and what it can do. Um, we'll look at some applications and, and just a general overview for everybody's um, amusement. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Okay, <clears throat> so smart sequencing technology, how it works. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll go through that. That's a little bit of fun. There's a, a couple of little videos and stuff that kind of demonstrate how the technology works. It's kind of alchemy. It's, it's still, um, I, I find it incredible every time I see it. It's great. So um, we'll also look at the advantages of, of hi-fi sequencing. So the advantages really of, of, of long read, really highly accurate um, uh, sequences. Um, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll have a look at that. We'll go through um, what you need um, and and some of the, uh, uh, the the workflow, how you how you make these libraries for sequencing and and, and what they look like because they're quite specialist and uh, and then we'll go through briefly some of the applications that you can apply to highly accurate long read sequencing and then I'll finish off with um, just a few sort of documents if you want further reading and and, and such like. Um, what I won't cover today is is the kind of data analysis side um, um, of this in any detail or all the bioinformatics so I won't I won't be covering that today. However, for those of you that are into that, um, we do have a, a, it's a its own series if you like a, um, an Australian New Zealand wide um, pack bio bioinformatics workshop um, session. This is uh, sort of jointly hosted by the Australian Genome Research Facility, AGRF, and Millennium Science, and of course with, with PAC Bio. So it's, uh, it's a two-day a two um, um, workshop series, uh, a week apart. 21st of October, we'll be looking at genome assembly um, uh, itself using um, PAC Bio Hi-Fi reads. Um, and, and focusing on, on the tools and, and, and what you need for, for, for genome assemblies 
um, whole genome sequence. Um, and then a week later on the 28th of October, um, we'll be looking specifically at ge genome annotation using that, that's that word again, isoseq, so, um, so transcriptome, um, full length transcript sequencing and, um, and how to annotate your genome from that. So um, if you're interested in the biomatics, uh, bioinformatics side, and, and I think uh, these days everybody should be, um, and then please uh, go to the Millennium Science website, um, it's down there, um, and go to the events tab and, and you'll see this amongst other things that, that Millennium Science uh, are, are doing at the moment, um, and you'll find this, this set of workshops you can register. So um, please um, do that. Just going to check the chat here. Okay, maybe there was a, an issue just launching the slides to start with. I do apologise. So, um, okay, so let's get uh, let's get to it. So, how does smart sequencing work? All right. So, oh, there's lots of little videos running. So, um, my uh, colleague James Miller is on the call, and uh, he'll be monitoring um, uh, closely for me to say smart cell all the way through this. Um, through this talk and not say flow cell because that's a different way of doing sequencing but it's very very easy to get these words muddled up so i will do my best to say smart cell all the way through um for james's benefit uh, so but um yeah he'll, he'll dot my pay i'm sure if uh, if i get it wrong but that's all good um so how does it work well the smart cell um in a, in a for pack biosequencing on a sequel it's um uh, a little kind of chip about the size of a postage stamp, uh, so around that sort of size, um, coded in, a, in like a plastic case um, that can be manipulated by the SQL2 instrument. So it could be moved around and then obviously loaded and, and things like that on, on the deck of the instrument. Um, it's uh, actually a glass base, optical glass base um, that has a, a metal coating. And um, within that metal coating, there are some sort of nano holes, about 100 um, nanometer diameter holes that are, that, that are called ZMWs or, or zero mode waveguides, which isn't easy to say either. So ZMWs. Um, and uh, there's about 8 million of those holes on, on a, a smart cell 8M uh, uh, chip that, that goes in the machine. The machine can run up to eight of these chips uh, in, a, in, a, in a run together. Um, uh, so you have a lot of sequencing power. Um, so how does the, the, the setup actually work to do the sequencing? Well, um, within the hole, um, the ZMW, you're able to put your reagents and you're able to bind your complex, which is your, your DNA molecule that you want to sequence with a polymerase. Um, and, and this is all, all um, uh, stuck to the, the bottom of the well, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, uh, and also a sequencing primer. That's the primer to start the sequencing off. And you have your, your um, reagents, your buffed reagents um, that, are, that are in that, in that well. Now, um, we'll come to this in a moment, but uh, the, the nucleotides that you're going to use for the, for the sequencing um, um, are, are fluorescently labelled. They have a fluorophore on. And um, uh, one of the tricks here of how it works is, is to be able to detect the fluorophore that you're incorporating as you're, as you're doing your real-time sequencing, um, but, uh, but not detect all the background. So, so how does this work? Well, you illuminate the wells from the bottom. So you have this glass, optical glass, you're able to illuminate at the bottom. And here's the clever bit. Um, because of the wavelength of the light and the size of the, uh, the nano hole, the ZMW, you only illuminate the very, very bottom of the well. Um, uh, it, it works a little bit for those of you who know about a microwave oven. You have all these microwaves flying around inside cooking things, but you're able to stand at the door of your microwave and, and see your food cooking without getting in the front of your face burnt off, right? And, uh, and this is because there's a mesh over the glass door of your microwave. And the hole in the mesh is smaller than the wavelength of the microwave, so they can't get through. And this is essentially the same thing that's going on here. The wavelength of the light only illuminates the very bottom of the well, so you don't pick up any of the background, effectively, of your, of your, of your um, fluorescently labelled nucleotides um, within the, the, the ZMW. Um, so that's kind of how you're able to um, sequence without a lot of background noise um, upsetting the, um, the, the, the data. Um, it does mean, however, of course, that you have to bring your 
mo molecule that you're sequencing the complex down to the very bottom of the well. And this is done because at the, at the very bottom of the ZMW here, if you can see my mouse, there's actually um, a, a biotin layer and, um, and the polymerase itself has um, um, streptavidin um, um, conjugated to it. So the streptavidin is, is drawn and, and to the biotin. And, uh, and so it's, 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 uh, it's stuck then on, on, on the, the bottom of the well. And so you're able to detect the reaction that's going on at the absolute um, sequency level of the polymerase. So that's how it kind of works. And again, there's a, uh, I think a little bit of movie stuff going on here. So, You've got your your um, four bases for your, your DNA, so your A's, G's, C's, and T's, and they each have a different fluorophore on, um, and uh, they're, they're they're linked. And when they come into the sequencing complex, the polymerase is um, able to incorporate the the next base, and um, and then uh, um, cleave off the the fluorophore. Um, for those sort of um, fractions of a millisecond, 10 milliseconds or something, fractions of a second that, that this is actually in place. Um, the, um, the optics are able to detect that fluorophore and, um, and then it's, it's cleaved off so that the background level um, is gone. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if this is a little bit of a movie going on here as well. So you can see the next base in, the, in here is uh, there's a T that's, um, that's being used as a template. So it's going to incorporate that A um, as it goes in. Um, it's incorporated, there'd be a flash of, of light effectively from that fluorophore when it's detected and then it's moving on for the next base, which is going to incorporate a T. So um, that's kind of how it works. Um, so again, in, in order, um, you've got uh, an A coming in, you've got that 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 um, detection. Um, and this is, this is um, a real-time detection. So you actually run a movie. Um, um, if you're making a movie when you're running PAC biosequencing. Um, so you run a movie for the optics. You're not um, just uh, running a part of a reaction and then taking a still image at, at one point. This is continuous. Um, it, it's uh, called smart sequencing and that's uh, a, a nice play on words, but that's single molecule real-time sequencing, single molecule real-time sequencing. So smart sequencing. So you're running this movie, so it's, it's detecting the whole time. It sees that flash of light, and as you can see from this sort of trace below, you effectively got this, this, this just slight super background, um, and then you get the big flash for the, the incorporation of that base. And then the polymerase has to, um, to cleave off that fluorophore and move on to incorporate the next base. And that's a kind of set cadence. There's a rhythm to this. It's, uh, I show my age and say sort of uh, uh, Phil Collins drumming, but you probably don't know who Phil Collins is, you young people. Don't know he's drumming so good now. He's not, uh, not, not faring so well, this poor Phil. But um, anyway, um, it's, it's a very regular beat uh, that, that's happening and, uh, as, as each of these bases is incorporated. So then the next base moves in. In this case, it's, uh, uh, it's this T moving in. So there's a different flash color and that's incorporated and so on and so forth. And it moves through the, the chain doing, doing real sequencing. A little bit more of an example of that happening in the middle there as each base is incorporated and it, and it reads the, uh, the, uh, the peak of, of fluorescence. As I said, you can put up to eight of the uh, the smart cells onto the uh, the deck and uh, and and uh, prepare all the sequencing reactions and basically walk away, let the machine run those um, reactions. So yeah, we'll just see that movie again, more animation, and and this is a basically a still from the movie if you like. So uh, in in real time, the software is able to look at that movie and see the different. Um, um, colored flashes of light and, and build that, um, that sequencing pattern um, uh, within the space on the smart cell for each of the, uh, the ZMWs on the smart cell. Okay, so that's uh, an overview of the alchemy, as I said, of how this all uh, manages to, to work. So um, uh, what are the advantages of, of, a, of a, a highly accurate long read sequencing system compared to other things like that? I'm just gonna check my, uh, Q and A is going on here. If there's anything I need to think about, okay. All right, websites and things up. That's good. All right. So yes, what are the, what are the advantages? Well, on the right there, that's that's the um, the SQL two instrument. Um, it's uh, it's a, a size of a, I don't know a filing cabinet type size, a fairly big instrument. Um, 
I guess the keys for 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 using pet biosequencing is that it's a long read platform. Okay, there's um, obviously short read pl platforms out there that are used, um, you know, extensively and very powerfully and do incredible work. But um, they do have certain limitations, and we'll, we'll we'll look at that a little bit as we go through. But here we've got um, the ability to 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 read very very long molecules um, over 100 kb. More, you'll see some some um, sort of data in a minute. Um, and you're able to sequence, you know, from from reasonably small um, amplicons, say half a kb, up to huge insert sizes, um, uh, up to 50 kb. Um, and of course, it's highly accurate. And there's a few tips and tricks that go on to, to achieve this incredible accuracy, because of course, the sequencing itself is um, it's real time sequencing with a polymerase. Now, polymerases aren't perfect. They make errors um, and they make errors. I hear different numbers, but they make errors anywhere around one in a hundred bases or something like that. Um, but they do absolutely make errors and, um, and it's uh, essentially random um, for the polymerase. Um, but because we're using a thing called HiFi, which we'll explain shortly, this, um, this, this mode of sequencing, we're able to essentially um, dial out um, those errors and, and achieve a really, really, really high accuracy for the sequencing that you have. It's also single molecule um, resolution. So unlike the, um, the flow cell that I mentioned earlier, where you um, put molecules on and do a bridge amplification and basically amplify those products up in order to get a signal, it's not like that with packed biosequencing. You're, you're sequencing that single molecule. So, um, so if you have very rare um, variants um, uh, in, in the, um, the library that you have, you're able to detect them. You're not, you're, you're not seeing any PCR artifacts or amplification artifacts. It's you're, you're sequencing each and every single molecule molecule in real time with very high accuracy. Um, because of the way it sequences too, the coverage um, is, is very, very, very good, um, independent of, of GC content. So um, I think there's a graph a little bit later on that demonstrates that, but I can, I can do a spoiler, a spoiler alert for that. And, and basically it's, it's, it almost doesn't matter that the GC content, the, um, the, the coverage is so uniform from, you know, 10% GC up to 90% GC, it's, it does an incredibly good job right across. Um, and something we'll mention a little bit later on as well, you do have this added bonus that um, if your DNA is methylated, you're able to detect that without um, a, a heap of, of chemical um, reactions and, and, and modifications in order to try and, and, and detect those, uh, those methylated bases. It's actually doing it. And the machine kind of doesn't know it's doing it, but it is doing it. Because of that cadence, that rhythm that we were talking about, methylated bases um, take a little bit of a different time to go through the polymerase and, and the software can, can look at the traces because it breaks the rhythm, right? And uh, it can look for those breaks in the rhythm and say, ah, there must have been a methylation event there that's that's caused that to slow things down a bit. So it's able to to characterize the the epigenome uh, modifications as well. So as I say, this talk is is focusing on high fi but it wouldn't be complete without sort of um, telling where it all began as far as uh, pack biosequencing um, goes. Um, it's a long read um, platform, so it started off by doing long reads. So you would take your DNA you would fragment it and you would make these um, these essentially circular molecules by putting these um, uh, bark um, um, little uh, adapters on the end that circularize the molecule, these little smart bell, you know, sort of dumbbell molecules um, on the ends. Um, and then you would set the complex and it would form at the bottom of your ZMW, you'd have your, your sequencing primer bound into that little um, smart bell molecule and you'd have your, your, your polymerase and it would start sequencing and, um, and you could have really, really long molecules and it would chug, 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 and it would chug right through. And uh, if you've got really, really long sequencing, it might go around this um, um, uh, smart bell at the other end and even chug a little bit down into the, um, um, the, the reverse strand, if you like. But you would determine um, this a little bit by when the reaction kind of ran out of steam. So you were incorporating the nucleotides and the polymerase was, was, was starting to suffer from the light exposure and everything else. Um, or, or you'd set your movie time short. So you would set a, you know, a 10 hour movie or a 20 hour movie or whatever was enough to do the sequencing that you thought you needed. So you, it, it, you you'd just see the sequencing that you needed and you've got, you'd get 
um, sequence from all of these molecules. And of course, if you'd randomly shared your, your genomic DNA, let's say, um, you'd have smatterings from all over and, um, and uh, you'd have all that sequence. And then the, the software could do some clever tricks and, and um, you could see uh, a pathway in here or maybe a better one even at the start here under the long read sign here. Um, so if at a particular base here it started to do the alignment of all these 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 um, pieces of sequence, uh, it might call say a T here and in this molecule everything else lined it up but it called an A. Um, but then in this one it also called a T and a T and a T. Okay, so it would say that probably out of all that alignment um, you've got four calls of T and one of A. That A is, is probably an error. So you could, using the software, you could dial out those errors and, and it would increase the, the, the accuracy uh, to some degree. But it's obviously not a perfect system uh, that way, because depending on the type of error, whether it was a, a random polymerase error or whether it's actually is something just a really rare uh, event. So moving on to hi-fi, this is where things change a bit. And uh, I might just flick back a slide and, and uh, if I can, and, uh, and just start that um, movie again. So you see the polymerase is chugging our right, way through and uh, a random molecule is actually making that double stranded now. And then it comes back to where it started and it starts to displace the strand. So it goes into a sort of rolling circle replication for anybody that knows their viral uh, virology um, uh, um, uh, theory. Uh, it's a really, really stable way of, of, of copying DNA. Um, polymerases love being in this rolling circle uh, mechanism. Um, and so this is effectively what is happening of these molecules. So it didn't escape the notice of PAC bio, of course, that rather than set really, really long molecules of DNA, if you just shorten them up a little bit and let this chug, chug, chug through, go around the smart bell at the other end, then sequence back down the reverse strand, round where it started and round and round and round, you would have multiple passes of the same molecule. And this was called circular consensus sequencing, CCS mode, it's still on the um, on, on the, the software of the unit, but, but it's now, um, uh, known as hi-fi so high fidelity read so hi-fi is the same as ccs it's uh, it's just the, the the buzz term for it really so um so this is what hi-fi sequencing is you're you're effectively rather than taking multiple scattered fragments and trying to do the alignments and, and dial out errors you're actually reading the same molecule in both directions multiple times um and therefore here um you know you've got the same molecule so if you look down here and you saw that A, and then here was a T, but all the rest of these were A, 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 you can be very confident that that T call was just a, a random error from the polymerase. And you can dial that out of the sequencing and, 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 and form a consensus that is incredibly, incredibly accurate. And it's still a very long fragment. It's you know, up to 20, 25 KB or whatever. So it's still a very long piece of, of, of sequence, and, and, but has got a massively high Q score. So it's very, very accurate. OK, so looking at, at some metrics, um, uh, some of these slides are actually a little bit old now, um, but uh, they, they serve the purpose for, for the example. And this is an example of some um, hi-fi um, sort of metrics that you get off the machine. This is um, some human DNA that was um, uh, fragmented and size selected to, to 20 KB. So a nice um, tight distribution around 20 KB molecules. Um, and this is a graph showing you basically the um, amount of reads you're getting per, per read length. So um, uh, clearly if you've got a, a 20 KB molecule and you've gone around here, this um, 100,000 reads, you've, you've gone around five times and you've gone around the molecule 10 times and 15 times in some, with a few of these molecules, you've gone round and round and round many, many times. So um, you can um, prepare very, very accurate sequencing from this. Um, and just as an example, as we said, the insert was 20 KB, uh, number of, of raw bases is getting up, getting towards um, uh, 400 gig there. The total number of reads, um, as we said, we had 8 million holes in, in, in that um, smart cell. Um, there's 8 million ZMWs. We've got 
just over half of them filled here. As I say, this slide is a little bit old now. Um, this would be considered um, um, pretty good, over 50% um, um, loading, um, but just very recently, there's been a small chemistry tweak and software tweak for the, for the, um, the, the sequencing now. Um, and there's a thing called adaptive loading that you can do for certain applications that allows you to load um, at a slightly higher concentration and the machine actually monitors the loading to get the most uh, efficient. And we're seeing with customers now in Australia, um, we're seeing loadings of 70% of plus um, um, quite routinely now, which is fantastic. So you're now talking about getting close up to, to maybe 6 million of the ZMWs loaded um, out of the uh, 8 million total, which is um, really amazing. Um, so as you can see here, um, how many um, uh, uh, reads that you're getting that um, uh, that, that are um, yeah, the size. So over half the reads are greater than 190 kb. So that's you can imagine how many times that's gone round that that 20 kb molecule. Um, and uh, again, there's some some other stats here. The top five percent of reads are um, over 280 kb, and um, and the longest read is over 300 kb. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a very long read platform, right? And um, in this case, the um, the average here was, um, as I say, this is slightly outdated now. So these numbers are actually all improving. Things are moving to the right, if you like, on this graph. But um, the the um, the average here was about 325 gig of overall base. And when we start to look at quality, it's a similar sort of graph here. So it's number of reads against the, the, the read quality or Q score here. Um, because you get so many reads and the quality is so good, um, the software kind of defaults now to um, anything less than Q20. It just bins, it goes into a, a bin file. Um, you can actually look at that if you need to analyze it, but uh, essentially that's that's um, that's filtered at that point. So anything below Q20 is, um, is just um, um, binned. Um, so again, from, from this uh, same uh, sort of data set, um, We've got the insight side of 20 KB. So we've got um, the, the number of high five bases uh, greater than Q20 here. We've got um, about 26 gigs. So um, number of uh, greater than Q20 reads about 1.5 million. And, um, and the, the, the uh, mean accuracy, uh, as you can see, well over Q20 here. So 99.92%. So as you can see from the, the peak, most of that is, is in the sort of Q30 to Q40 range. So um, so as I say, that's very, very highly accurate sequencing um, due to this hi-fi mode of, of, of being able to um, generate that, that, um, that complex sequence round and round the same molecule, and then let the software um, iron out any of the um, random polymerized errors that are in that sequencing. Um, some uh, data here uh, for um, looking at, um, the, there's some different movie times, as I um, said earlier, but looking at different size molecules um, and running um, uh, yeah, different, um, dif different movie times to, to um, uh, sequence around the molecule enough times to get, again, very highly accurate um, sequencing. So um, these are just estimates of, of um, the QV20 and QV30 scores you get um, un under these conditions. So again, um, you're getting an awful lot of reads at very, very high accuracy from very short molecules right up to, to, to really quite long molecules. And um, you just adjust the movie times accordingly to, to capture the amount of data that you need. Um, and consensus accuracy, uh, again here, um, uh, it's important, I suppose, um, to note that um, uh, uh, consensus accuracy is, is, is a function of, of, of the coverage uh, as well as, as how well your, your, your sequencing chemistry is performing. So um, here, if, if you've got a 30 times coverage, um, you're, you're looking at the quality being up at around Q50, which is 99.999, um, which is uh, in, incredibly high. So um, it's important to, um, to note that. Uh, and we did mention this slightly earlier, um, uh, 
due to GC content, you've got very uniform coverage. It's, it's, it's effectively immune to the, to the GC content that you have in the, in, in the sequence that, you're, that you're, you're, you're trying to analyze. So, um, you know, really right across the board, um, the sequencing coverage is, is very, very even. And we've seen examples of that recent, well, reasonably recently when um, um, uh, COVID uh, was being sequenced and, and, um, and, and, and being worked out. Um, essentially looking at looking at the fragments that they were sequencing it didn't matter about its gc content they got such even coverage across the genome when they when they were um put, putting the genome sequence together so that was good and lastly what we mentioned about um epigenetics um just an example here of of how that methylation is is essentially captured um, um uh, you know uh, fortuitously really and uh, and and the software has been built now so to, to to be able to analyze this so we said we had this lovely cadence this lovely rhythm of each base being incorporated in 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 time and it holding for a few few milliseconds um while while it was um, um held in the polymerase and then the fluor fluorophore was cleaved off and then it moved on and there would be a a, a regular gap um maybe half a second before the next base went in but all of a sudden you sometimes see this gap of over a second. Um, and uh, this indicates in this case, um, looking at the sequence, um, that there was um, uh, an adenine methylation um, here. Um, and it's sort of shown here, I hope you can see, you've got a, a, a methyl A, they occur in these GATC motifs, um, and the, the A's are both methylated. Um, so of course you're reading off one strand, um, when you come to the, the methylated A here, it takes a little bit of a while for the polymerase to, to process that um, and be able to incorporate the, the T as, as the, um, the complementary base. So the software can look for these gaps when it sees it on the reverse strand as well, because this is a palindrome and, and you get it on both strands, it's able to look at the sequence, see the delay in uh, the time on both strands and say that this is confidently called a methylation event. So you're able to, to get some, some epigenetic data from, from your sequencing as well. Uh, and that's kind of free because <laughs> uh, you're not having to do any extra work. It's just incorporated into the timing of the way the data is collected. So a bonus. Um, system products and workflow. Okay, um, so a little bit about um, how you prepare sample for, for sequencing. We won't dwell on this because as I say, this is really just a high level overview for the, for the first session in the, in the Lunch and Learn series. Um, so you need to make a library in order to sequence. So you're gonna start off with your genomic DNA, let's say, and you're going to, um, to do some fragmentation and some, some maybe some size selection and cleanups and, and things like that. Um, there is a nice uh, library prep kit, the Express Template Prep Kit 2 is the latest um, kit uh, um, uh, around um, for, for making your libraries. Um, and uh, you can make libraries basically from, from any um, source. If you've got genomic DNA, you can fragment it. If you've got um, amplicons, um, you can um, put adapters, um, uh, the smart bell adapters on the end and use that. If you've got RNA, you can synthesize cDNA and again, put the smart bell adapters on and sequence that and then you've got your ISO sequ sequencing. So um, it's it's very versatile and adapted to, to all sorts of sequencing um, and um, once you've got your library made, it goes onto the machine um, uh, and uh, you've got various options um, of the way you set the machine up. You can run a single smart cell or up to eight smart cells in a run. Um, you put all your reagents and everything on board. There's chilled chambers and, and, and plates where they need to be. Uh, and, and essentially you can um, set everything up through the, um, the SmartLink software. Um, you, you do a run design and then it's, it's just go and uh, walk away um, and your data is then um, stored on on board that that um, instrument and then can go up to your your, your servers so um, yes again uh, probably a, a, some of the detail we've already gone over just a little bit but um, 
um, you know, just a table at the top showing insert sizes um, and um, just note that um, there is a low input um, protocol available. There's actually now an ultra low input um, application available too. Um, so if you've got really, really scarce amounts of, of um, DNA from uh, you know, people doing it from like insect legs and, and things like that, where you've got tiny amounts of tissue, um, there is an ultra low um, input um, protocol also available. Um, but again, the pathways you're going to have your your DNA, say genomic DNA in this case. Um, so you've got your your DNA. You're going to fragment that, um, Kavara shearing or or, or or something similar, mega raptors or, or whatever to do your your shearing, um, and you end up with very um, odd pieces of molecules due to what the way they fragment. So you need to do some damage repair, um, and damage repair is actually to the internals of the molecule. You need to make a nice smooth road for the polymerase to run through. If you like, uh, it doesn't want pot holes and nicks and all sorts of things in there. So you do a damage repair um, and then you do an end repair to tidy up the way these ends are fragmented to make a nice um, um, even molecule. Uh, you actually, for different applications, it depends, but we can also do a little tailing event here so that you would ligate on these smart bell adapters um, and they can be um, uh, a T-tail um, and, and a, a, um, to help the ligation um, work along. Um, so that's more common these days. Um, and then you're going to purify those, those um, smart bell library molecules. And uh, in a bit more close up, it's kind of what they look like. In, if you did your tailing, there'd be an extra, extra base on the end here for the tail. That's not uh, crucial right now. Um, but as you see, it's essentially, or, or, or it's nicely put here, topologically circular molecule. So um, yes, it's a circular molecule because of these little smart bell adapters that, that, that go on the end. Um, and, uh, and at the base of that, um, uh, that, 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 that little um, dumbbell here is a, is a primer um, annealing sequence. So this is your sequencing primer that binds here. So this is where the complex will form with your polymerase and, um, and start for your sequencing and it will run through as you saw in those little videos like a chain and uh, run sequencing around and around the molecule. Okay, I think it's going to do it. Do it again. So, as I say, we won't dwell on the on the long read, but um, essentially that's how it all starts. And you can read very, very, very long fragments. And in some cases, this can also be very useful if you're looking for um, for um, variations in in genomes where you've got um, very, very large, say, inserts or deletions or tandem repeats or you know some sort of of, of, of structural variation in the in the genome, which is very, very large. It can still be useful to be able to um, sequence very, very long molecules. It can also help um, put together um, your assemblies and things in some cases to have some extra long reads as well. And, and some applications are still are still using the, the, the long read type um, sequencing, but most of the PacFi applications now have clicked to this, um, this so-called Hi-Fi, um, where you're reading round and round a slightly shorter, albeit 25 KB, but still slightly shorter molecule. Okay. And it's all sort of integrated through some software as everything is these days. So um, uh, you have um, some instrument control software on the on the SQL 2 itself, but then um, you have a, a software called SmartLink, um, which will, will run on your computers and connects to the, um, the, the SmartLink server that, that runs your instrument and everything else. We'll look at that in a bit more detail. So um, through SmartLink, um, you, you've got various options. You've got sample setup. Well, um, you, you give the software a little bit of information about the size of your library molecules and the concentration you have. Um, and it does the maths for you and tells you um, how much of your library you need to add, how much sequencing primer you need to add, how much polymerase you need to add to get this complex at the right ratios of, of for annealing at the most efficient um, uh, rates. So it does some sample setup calculations for you. There's also a run design where you put in information about your sample or multiple samples you're putting together. There's obviously options with the, um, the smart bell adapters to have barcodes or if you're using Amplicons, you can incorporate um, um, some, some um, barcodes tags in, in there so you can multiplex things together. 
um, and you can incorporate that information in the run design, of course. Um, and uh, you can also now with the latest software, you can import and export um, um, the, these run design files for, and use Excel or something to, to edit them um, rather than have to work sort of on instrument or, or within SmartLink to, to do the run design. So that can be um, quite convenient, particularly if you're running a lot of similar samples, but you, you just want to change the, um, the barcode, you know, multiplexing information or just change the sample name very subtly because you're running a lot of the similar sorts of things. It makes the editing a lot easier. Um, run QC, well, um, does what it says on the tin. You can monitor your runs uh, as, as they're in progress. So you start to see some run statistics. Um, you, you may start to see um, like the base incorporation rate speeds and, and the amount of data you're, you're collecting, the amount of ZMWs are off the off the ADM smart cell that you've actually loaded. So loading efficiencies, you can see all that sort of thing um, in real time as, as things are running. There's a sort of data management um, tool there. So um, once data is saved, you can you can move that data around to different folders. You know, import things, delete things, uh, all the usual sorts of stuff. You can also bring in um, references um, if you're if you're aligning against a reference, that sort of stuff. Um, and then there's the smart analysis part of of, of the um, the software as well. So that performs certain secondary analysis functions. So it does your assemblies if that's what you want to do. Um, you can do that either seek that transcript analysis so it can find the different ISA forms and uh, the great thing because it is single molecule kill sequencing um, for, for, for the for ISA seek not only are you finding all the different ISA forms that are there and, and, and in each experiment I see in Australia it's always novel ISA forms being found it's just coming up all all the time but you're also getting essentially a digital count because it's single molecule sequencing so you're getting um, a digital representation of, of the abundance of each transcript compared to others so um, you've got digital gene expression kind of going on there as well um, so uh, that's all part of the analysis i think in the latest iterations of, of smart link 10.1 um, there's also a, a special pipeline now for for sars um, um, cov1 or cov2 um, sequencing so there's a, a pathway for covid sequencing now with the um, reference built in and, um, and various data metrics that you can pull if you're specifically looking at that um, and um, yeah other other updates to the um, um, various assembly and, and uh, uh, analysis tools that are there. Um, yeah, uh, a representation of basically everything linking from the SmartLink server. Um, so you can run multiple machines and multiple computers off the same server. Um, I don't, not aware really of anyone in Australia that's got multiple SQL systems linked up, but certainly multiple computer systems linked to their servers so that they can um, do their analysis and, and also their run setups and things independently. So um, that's good. There's also, as we said, um, some control software on the instrument itself. So it's got a screen on the instrument. Um, and again, you you can put everything in smart link separately but then you can select the run and that you've designed and um, then it, it does some clever things about the deck so it knows um, which reagents and things need to be there in order to um, uh, accommodate the run that you've set up so it knows how many smart cells need to be there how many sequencing plates all of that sort of stuff and it checks checks the um, um, the RFID codes on, on the reagents and things to make sure everything's loaded properly so it's a, a fairly foolproof uh, uh, you have to double check to empty the waste bin and a few other things but um, other than that um, it will prompt you um, as you load the instrument and away you go so so what can you sequence well briefly we'll um, we'll, we'll cut through this um, uh, there's a number of, of different um, applications um, from whole genome sequencing that we talked about, the RNA sequencing, ISOSeq that we talked about, targeted sequencing, so um, effectively having lots of specific primers either side of a particular target. So um, this might be in, say, an agricultural situation. If you had, um, if you're looking for, you know, positive traits in a in a plant, you may have parents that you've crossed, and you can um, look at the parents and a lot of progeny uh, at a particular target and and, um, and and see uh, how, how those genes are, 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 are whether they're there or not, which parent they're from, that sort of thing. So you can target a particular locus and look for for, for um, sequence that way. For example, then the complex populations. Well, that's the the sort of microbiome type type sequencing, sequencing a complex samples. So it might be a soil sample or a water sample, and, and seeing which microbes are there. Um, either um, total total sequencing of, of of the total DNA in that sample, or you can target again um, from 
that and, and target say 16S and ITS sequences um, in those populations. And as I mentioned as well, you kind of get the, the free add-on there of the, of the epigenetics. So um, you can monitor um, methylation patterns to some degree. And that all fits onto a, a smart cell AM. There's a, a, as I said, a posty stamp size sort of chip with that glass and, and the metal top and, uh, and the holes in. So a few examples, um, nearly everybody talks about human stuff all the time, so I try to um, go against the flow a little bit. I'm actually a plant a microbiologist by training from years ago, so I try to throw in some plant examples where I can. Um, and uh, so for, for whole genome sequencing here, um, PacBio is based over in California, um, um, uh, San Francisco. Um, they decided that they needed to, to show off some of their sequencing prowess, of course, and, and so um, what better to choose than a California redwood sequoia tree. There was other reasons that they chose it. One of their competitors in the long read sequencing field, um, um, Oxford Anaphore Technologies, had also sequenced uh, sequoia. So they kind of had a bit, little bit of a, of a, of a playoff um, against them, and I went well on the numbers but um but the sequencing was quite extraordinary i know a little bit about the project how it was set up and and um what i think was really impressive apart from the data quality and and the assembly and and, and everything else that they did is how quickly they did everything so um, essentially they sent some of their their their, their team out into in, into the woods to collect pine needles um do the dna extraction do all the fragmentation make the libraries do the sequencing <clears throat> and they did it all in a really really short time so they did the whole thing done assembly and everything <clears throat> in a two or three weeks i think it was it was quite amazing sorry about that channeling minor gin and tonic if only um so yes um obviously plants to um have very complicated genomes usually very large genomes and when we get into some of the grass sort of families they also are not necessarily diploid they're like wheat as hexaploid so it's kind of three genome components to them and things like sugarcane and stuff are very very complicated with breaks and rearrangements all over the place so they're very very complicated and you need those long reads to get through all of those variants um, uh, and, and be able to piece it all together so um, so there's an example there you can read the publications um, about sequencing here the sequoia 27 gig hexaploid genome so um, uh, yeah, no, no mean feat to, to put that all together. And the processing time, assembly time, as you can see, because it's a lot of that assembly is done within the hi-fi read where it's looking at that, that compressed data, um, you're, you're able to assemble with that incredible accuracy very, very fast. So six days compared to six months for the um, less accurate um, ONT data. Um, so variant detection, moving on, um, this is uh, um, uh, from a, a genome in a bottle um, sample, so um, we are back to, to human again, it had to happen, didn't it? Um, <clears throat> again, advantages of, of, uh, of long read. Um, here you've got some alumina um, short read, uh, and of course you get um, amazing depth and good accuracy, of course, from alumina. But as soon as you've got strange rearrangements or repeats or something that, that go over the, 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 the short read sides, it's almost impossible to map them back because um, you just don't know which way they fit together. Um, of course, ONT kind of does the best it can with the accuracy that it has. So it, it does have some inaccuracies in here, but it does manage to span the regions, of course. Um, but um, but it can't really detect all the, the variants accurately. Um, but um, with HIFI reads, of course, you are able to go across those long sections and also have really, really, really good high quality data and, and find all, all the variants and, and with very high accuracy, whether that's um, um, very small variants, of course, whether that's just a SNP, a single nucleotide, um, whether it's, um, it's, it's a small like trinuclide um, change like an indel and uh, uh, um, a deletion or an insertion of a small sequence or a massive structural variant a, a large section that's been either deleted or rearranged or flipped or, or whatever and um, it can get find all of that with very high precision and recall and you can see the table there on the right of, of how it compares to, to some of the other technologies and overall um, yeah the pack bio with its long read and high accuracy does a very, very, very good job. And as you can see from this particular example with the genome in the bottle sample, um, not only was it able to sequence through this region, but it was even able to phase the genomes between the, the, the two haplotypes there with the clear variants. So very powerful. 
RNA sequencing, we mentioned a little bit. Um, again, uh, you may have your gene sequence, but you don't know exactly how it's spliced and um, if there's alternative promoters in different places and all sorts of things that can be going on here that we're only really now beginning to understand a bit more about. Um, when you're able to sequence full length transcripts, um, uh, it gives you a lot of power to find all the variation and um, the, also the, the, the representation of, of, of those different transcripts in, in the mix. So you've, you've got some, some digital expression going on there of, 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 of the relative abundance to one another. Um, and as I say, each time I see data coming out from ISA-seq, um, um, there's more and more novel isoforms being found. And, um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a powerful area of research right now. And um, being able to get that with, with, with the accuracy and the length is, 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 is critical for, for ISA-seq. And um, as we said, there's the, um, the, the workshop session on the bioinformatics for, for that, where we'll, we'll look at a, um, one of the sessions will be on the, um, the transcript data analysis. Um, targeted sequencing, yeah, like we said, you've got primers either side, um, and uh, you can look specifically your, your locus or your 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 region of interest. Um, depending how well you're able to amplify, you can um, obviously target you know quite large sections. So here's an 11 kb, uh, so long PCR amplification, and um, yeah, able to um, detect um, any variants within within that um, within that region, and uh, and use the software that's there to um, again to phase and, and to map all the um, the variation that's within that um, within that space. So yeah, going through quickly because this is uh, just an overview. Complex populations um, we've talked about before in one of the other lunch and learn sessions six months ago, the first set set. Um, so again, um, you can take these are uh, human fecal samples, and you can look at um, at the whole um, 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 biological activity there, if you like, and 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 uh, sequence every, everything. Um, so you get full genomes. Um, again, because of the length, you're able to 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 piece stitch this all together really, really accurately and really, really well, and um, and, and basically come up with whole whole microbe uh, microbe genomes. Um, but of course, you can also incorporate the targeting here, if you like, and you can use some 16s um, primary and, and, and amplify the entire 16S region and ITS as well, if you want, um, and, and then get down to, very, um, to, to beyond species um, 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 uh, identification of the, of, the, of the different bacteria that are, that are in there. You can actually get to, um, um, to the, the, the individual isolates level. Um, so even within the bacteria, there are often multiple um, uh, 16S um, uh, genes there, and, and they, they can even be variation within the same um, bacterial um, so you can actually find that information. So a single bacteria may have multiple um, 16S and that's kind of represented in those little charts there. Um, and finally, I suppose the epigenetics we talked about, you're also able to find um, your, your, your methylome, if you like, um, and, and, and see what's happening with the, with the methylation state of, of, of your, your DNA as well. So we're getting towards the end now. Um, what can you do with a single smart cell? We tend to throw this one up. Uh, essentially, on a, on, you can do just about anything with a, with a single smart cell. Um, obviously, um, whole genome sequencing will depend on your size of your genome. Some of the, the, the big plants and, and, and things that is, um, you're, you're, you're obviously going to have to use a, a few smart cells. But um, for a de novo assembly run, uh, for genomes up to two gig, um, you can use a, a single smart cell. Again, for the microbial de novo assembly, you can probably multiplex up about 48 um, different isolates onto a single smart cell and sequence. Um, for, for, for the variation detection, if you really want for incredible uh, precision and recall, um, up to three gig genomes, you're probably looking at two smart cells um, for, for up to a three gig genome. So for human stuff, for variant, full variant detection, probably two um, smart cell um, run. But for structural variant detection, um, then um, you can probably go with a couple of samples on a single smart cell and so on and so forth. Um, you can multiplex up um, and, uh, and and go and, uh, on a single smart cell. So again, value for money with the run, um, um, you can you can multiplex a lot onto a single smart cell um, and get very high. Oh, it's it's Karen, yeah. Hello. Um, you're at least for me. Um, you seem to be just dropping in and out. Um, oh. I might suggest if you turn your video off. It might Proof the audio because the last like minutes and like that. I, I can do that if I know how to do that. It uh, does sound okay for me, Paul. It's James here. 
Okay. Oh, well, hopefully it's all right for people. We're just at the end here anyway, so um, I can probably stop sharing. Um, look, there's lots of information here from PacBio. If you go to the PacBio website, you can find uh, all the latest publications and posters and, and, and various literature, all the application files, how to make the libraries, what, what you'll need, all their reagents and things. Um, and if you need anything, you can contact Millennium Science or, or directly to myself and I can guide you. Um, there's also this um, this resource online, the Extract DNA site. So if you're, it's really critical to get good quality um, DNA from whatever you're wanting to sequence the best you can. And there's a resource here for people that have, have, have extracted DNA from all sorts of species, plants, animals, um, you know, across across all the all, all the um, the families and things. Um, you can have a look if somebody might have tried to um, get DNA from a puffer fish or whatever, and, and they've got a, a guide to the method you might want to use. So, um, so I'll finish up there and I'll stop sharing. And um, I don't know if there's any questions or something. Oh, there's a, sh a short poll that's um, coming out. So anybody that's, that's on, we'd encourage you to just um, fill out this. It's only a, a few little questions. So um, if you can possibly do that for us, it would be helpful. Um, you'll see in the chat there's um, a link um, to um, the the pack bio part of the of the Millennium Science um, website if you need that information. And um, other than that, if there's any other questions, um, I can probably take them there. If not, we can finish up. I hope you enjoyed your lunch while you were learning. And. Um, a couple of questions from Harold in the Q&A section. Okay. Um, so the first question is, in what format can raw data be sent back to the researcher? Is it a giant FASTA file? It is a large file, um, but uh, um, but but things are are transferable. They is obviously large data because you've got a lot of sequencing data. Um, but um, particularly off the latest systems, so with C the SQL two E um, is using a lot of cloud based um, uh, uh, links now. So you're able to share with with your collaborators, researchers, um, and obviously if you're a, a service provider, cores are able to share that data very conveniently. But even with a, a SQL to um, our service providers are able to um, to return those those data. Um, um, it, it's a large you, you you want a good link, so an FTP link or something. But you can you can transfer those 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 bin files um, across to your um, to, to, to to your customers effectively. It's it's not too bad. Um, it's just can take some time. Um, what else have we got here? When sequencing amplicon. Yeah, so you can read the question. So Do they the have to next have question was when sequ That's a really great question, yeah. actually. Um, um, <clears throat> so what's going to happen? It will it will depend a little bit on the size, uh, the, the actual size of your amplicons. But um, but in general, yes, if you're if you're multiplexing together a lot of different amplicons, you certainly wouldn't want to have something at 500 bases and something at 5 kb or something. That 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 difference would would become a little bit more of a problem. But um, you know, if you had something at 5 kb and something at 3 kb or something, that would that would be less uh, less less challenging. Um, even with a big difference in size, it's not impossible. Um, it's it can be um, a bit tricky to optimize um, the loading concentrations because um, you, you get slightly preferential loading um, from from the um, the. the the, depending on the molecule size, it's not as actually as trivial as small ones absolutely load easiest and the big ones load least. Um, uh, it, there's, it's actually more of a curve than that. So very small things perhaps are a little bit more of a, of a problem to load as are the large ones and stuff in the middle load a little bit preferentially. So it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky one. You will need to do some optimization. I see the example here ranging between one and six KB. We've certainly seen projects like that running. In fact, I'm based in Adelaide and we've seen a project in Adelaide run um, a similar thing to that and um, as long as you have the coverage uh, and you're not running as lean as you possibly can you can certainly pull um, logically um, allowing for you know for the, for the um, pulling in molar terms um, and and um, and get a, a very good distribution across uh, across that sort of size range so it can be done happy to take that uh, a little bit further offline if you wish um, Harold um, uh, and finally 
what's the definition of the Q value? Is this a value assigned to each read or to every base in each read? Okay, so um, Q is, is, is essentially um, the, the quality metric. So it's, it's the quality of each base in that read, I believe. So um, yeah, you, you've got a quality metric for each base. Okay. All right, I think I think that's it in the Q and A section. 